get some on a 43. OPD is advised and they still have an active shooter inside. We're patching with Metro 9 for OPD. Stand by for further. Shooting, 
but there's multiple firearms involved. Can somebody go with me, please? Help! Yes, yeah, level 43. Receiving traffic from OP. They're not advising the subject, still barricaded at the side. LT, did we clear this back one to the left? Robertson, where are you at? Roughly 2 a.m. local time on the 12th of June 2016, a 29-year-old man by the name of Omar Mateen began to open fire on roughly 320 nightclubbers at the Pulse nightclub in downtown Orlando. Shortly after the attack began, Mateen dialed 911, swore allegiance to ISIS and said the US killing of Abu Wahib, a high-ranking ISIS leader, was the direct motivator behind the attack. The shooting itself was the deadliest mass shooting in American history at the time of it happening and still is the deadliest of its kind in the history of violence against the LGBTQ plus community. On top of these horrifying statistics though is that this would be the deadliest terrorist attack in America since the 9-11 tragedy. But how did we get to this point? Who exactly was Omar Mateen? Why was Pulse Nightclub selected? And what happened in the weeks and months leading up to this devastating attack are some of the questions that we'll be answering throughout this video. November 16th, 1986, and then Omar Mir Sadiq was born at the Long Island Jewish Medical Center in New Hyde Park, New York, to Afghan parents who had emigrated to America only years prior. Fast forward five years and the family relocated to Port St. Lucie in Florida where they settled for the years that followed. Mateen's baby years consisted of ice cream from McDonald's and trips to the mall with his family and every year during the holy month of Ramadan, the town's few Muslim families would get together to share meals. Mateen and his three sisters stood out though as they were children of Afghan immigrants in a small Florida town, but they were described as a quote, an all-American family, according to family friends. But friends and neighbors recall that Omar was often unpredictable, angry, and even sometimes threatening, with this behavior continuing right as early years in school. As a youngster, Omar was said to have displayed a preoccupation with violence, according to some sources. In elementary school, a third grade teacher wrote that Mateen was very active, constantly moving, verbally abusive, rude, aggressive, much talk about violence and sex, hands all over the place, 
honor the children in his mouth. That same teacher described an incident in which Mateen was supposed to be singing a song called Mariposa Mariposa, but substituted marijuana marijuana instead. By the time he moved up to middle school, he was described as a bully, disrespectful to girls, and acted like he was better than his classmates. Although one classmate would come out to say that Mateen himself was brutally bullied at school because of his weight and his Afghan heritage. Either way, after getting into multiple conflicts with other students and suffering poor grades due to behavioural problems, it would see Omar being moved to a separate class away from others. By the end of his middle school career, he was disciplined more than 30 times between both elementary and middle school, pursuing attention and occasional conflict rather than his studies. Although a new millennium was now underway, which meant a new chapter for some, this didn't necessarily apply to Omar in regards to his behaviour at school. Now attending Martin County High School in the year 2001, and at the young age of just 14, he would see himself expelled after being in a fight in math class. He would even go on to briefly be arrested without being handcuffed, where he would go on to be charged with battery and disturbing school functions, but the charges were later dropped. Although some sources do claim that he had a rough time at school, he was described by one classmate as a typical teen who played for his football team. The conflicting reports are more than likely due to people's different experiences with him. A teacher's and a student's or each individual student's experience wouldn't have been the same. Either way, after being expelled from Martin County High School, Omar would be placed in Spectrum Alternative School, a campus for students with behavioural issues. While attending, the September 11th attacks took place and Omar's reaction to this was noted as quite alarming. It was almost like surreal how happy he was about what had happened to America, is what a former classmate said about Omar's reaction to Flight 175 crashing into the south face of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. You see, a teacher had turned the TV on in school after the news had started to circulate about the incident. He would go on to describe Omar as standing up on a table claiming that Osama bin Laden was his uncle and that Osama bin Laden had taught him how to shoot AK-47s. The former classmate would go on to say that the rest of the students became angry the teacher could tell that they wanted to hurt him, so Omar was grabbed by the teacher and sent to the dean's office. Omar was said to have matured with time though, and was described as becoming obsessed with weightlifting. He shedded the flabbiness that had became a source of ridicule, and was that muscular people were even questioning whether he had turned to steroids. Spoiler alert, he did. But although he had started to mature, this reoccurring behavioural problem seemed to stick, as he was moved once again, this time to St. Lucie West at Sentinel High School, after getting into a fight with another student. Finally though, he finished off his education and graduated from Martin County's Stuart Adult Vocational School in 2003. After leaving the vocational school, Omar attended Indian River State College's Criminal Justice Training Program, where he went on to earn an Associate of Science degree in Criminal Justice Technology. This was in 2006, the same year he dropped Sadiq from his last name and now went as Omar Mateen. While studying, he began working as a recruit for the Florida Department of Corrections being assigned to the Martin Correctional Institution. He was even given a character reference by a police officer, given his troubled past that might confuse some. But comments made during his time on the course in April of 2007, the following year, would see him never become a fully certified corrections officer. He would comment about bringing a gun into class on the 14th of April 2007, which alarmed staff members. And when the Virginia Tech school shooting happened only two days later, this marked Mateen down as an issue. He was soon let go due to the comments on top of him falling asleep in class and at the gun range. The warden of Martin Correctional Institution, P.H. Skipper, wrote, In light of the tragic events at Virginia Tech, Officer Mateen's inquiry about bringing a weapon to class is at best extremely disturbing.
After being dismissed, Omar Mateen was hired by security firm G4S Secure Solutions in Jupiter, Florida. This would be his job moving forward right until the day of the shooting. He was subjected to two screenings, one conducted upon hiring and the other in 2013. It was said that these screenings had raised no red flags. He was screened because in order for him to work as an armed guard, he was required to undergo a full psychiatric evaluation or there needed to be a validated written psychological test. What should be noted though is that the procedures that G4S took in order to get these screenings done wasn't done in the correct manner and they later paid out around $150,000 for providing inaccurate psychological testing information after it found the psychologist whose opinion was necessary to permit Mateen to carry a weapon was not practicing as a screener. While working as a security guard for G4S, Omar Mateen would also be the subject to an FBI investigation in May of 2013 after he had made remarks at work. You see, Omar had told his co-workers that his family was linked to Al-Qaeda and that he had joined Hezbollah. He also would go on to say that he knew the brothers behind the Boston Marathon bombing. Throughout the investigation, Omar was questioned twice. In these interviews, he did admit to making the statements but explained he said them in anger because his co-workers had been teasing him. After 10 months, the investigation was closed and Omar Mateen was determined not to be a threat. He was placed on the terrorist watch list while the investigation was ongoing, but he was removed once the investigation was over. Disturbing new details this morning about an American who became a suicide bomber in Syria. Monar Mohabed Abu Salha reportedly returned to the U.S. after his training, but before he carried out the attack. Fast forward to July of the following year, and once again, Omar Mateen had come to the FBI's attention. This time, he'd been linked to Mona Mohamed Abu Salah, an American who travelled to Syria to commit a suicide bombing in late May of 2014. The two men had been acquainted and attended the same mosque. Given Omar's previous comments, it's easy to see why he was flagged once again, but the FBI's focus was on Abu Salah rather than Mateen, something that in the years that followed would come back to haunt them. By the end of 2014, Omar, after having dreams of becoming a respected law enforcement agent, would see himself working at a guards booth at the entrance to PGA Village, a golf resort community in Port St. Lucie. But even in this relatively low pressure position, he managed to unnerve and upset, especially when he seemed to think that he had been disrespected. He just slammed things around. You could tell he wanted to say something to whoever he felt had slighted him. A remarks made by a co-worker of Omar Mateen's. That same co-worker would later come out to tell reporters that even on occasion, Omar would cause delays at the gate if he felt disrespected by people. Reports go hazy in 2015 in regards to Omar's footsteps. All we do know for a fact is that he continued to work at PGA Village the usual. But that was all about to change in 2016 after a shopping trip to Disney Springs and the death of a certain man. The U.S. does believe the Pentagon announcing it earlier today that Abu Wahib was killed in this airstrike as he was traveling in a vehicle with three others, likely because there have been several reports quite candidly of Abu Wahib's death in the past and he has proven subsequently to be alive. So there's a little note of caution, if you will, to make sure that uh, they really did get him this time, to be clear. Uh, this is a guy they wanted very badly. The military emir of Anbar province, west of Baghdad, of course, responded responsible for a number of very vicious operations in that region, a number of executions, somebody they thought that they really wanted to get to, somebody that dates all the way back to the original Al-Qaeda in Iraq back during the height of the war there in the 2000s, in the early 2000s. So this is a guy that they've been looking for. He became an ISIS operative, and they do believe that they got him several days ago in that U.S. airstrike. 
There's many conflicting reports about what motivated Omar to kill. His father quoted as saying Omar had seen two men kissing in front of his family, so he became destined on murdering innocent gay people. But the reality of the situation is that it was the May 6th, 2016 US bombings in Syria that took out ISIS leader Abu Wahib that was the catalyst for the attack. This is in Omar's own words. Abu Wahib, some of you might recognise, was the man who sentenced three lorry drivers to death in the summer of 2013. It would be 15 days after Abu Wahib's murder on the 21st of May 2016 that Omar Mateen would be captured here on CCTV at Disney Springs in Orlando with his wife, Noor Salman, and their three-year-old son buying a toy at a store. While on Disney property, cell phone records show that Omar viewed a news website article describing how an ISIS spokesperson was calling for terrorist attacks in the United States over the holy month of Ramadan. And from here, it's believed that Omar Mateen began to plan his attack to kill innocent people. On the 31st of May 2016, he, along with his wife and their son, travelled to a Walmart store near the family's home in Fort Pierce. Omar purchases ammunition for the handgun that he used for his job as a security guard, while his wife and child walk up to the sporting goods checkout counter with another toy. Four days later on the 4th of June 2016, CCTV shows Omar by himself at the St. Lucie Shooting Centre purchasing a Sig Sauer MCX rifle, the rifle he would go on to use in his attack. Then later that evening, location data from cell phone towers suggests both Omar and his wife travelled south from Fort Pierce to West Palm Beach. It's been alleged that Omar could have been scoping out the City Place Entertainment Complex as a potential site for his attack. Surveillance footage then captures the couple making their way back home. At around 2am, they're seen at a convenience store with videos from toll booths showing the family was still on the road driving home at around 4.40am. Several hours later, footage captures Omar back at the St. Lucie Shooting Centre. Here he purchases a Glock 9mm handgun the same handgun he would eventually use in the attack. Cell phone location data then indicates both Omar and his wife travelled from Fort Pierce to the Orlando area on the afternoon of June 8th, 2016. Video retrieved from the Base Pro Shop store in Orlando shows Omar, his wife and their son standing at the checkout counter as Omar purchases three magazines for his rifle and candy for his child. The family then headed to the Florida Mall in Orlando where cameras recorded the couple and their son in stores including Victoria's Secret, Kay Jewelers and Michael Kors. Over the space of three weeks leading up to this point, it was said that the couple had spent the equivalent of their yearly income buying weapons, jewellery, clothing, electronics and toys. Either way, after leaving Florida Mall, cell phone location records suggest that the family visited Disney Springs once again. Surveillance camera shows Omar's wife and child inside a store as Omar wandered around outside at shopping and entertainment complex. A receipt from King O'Falafel restaurant in nearby Kissimmee indicates Mateen purchased dinner at around 10.29pm. In a false statement given to the FBI, Omar's wife Noor told agents that both she and her husband drove to the Pulse nightclub for around 20 minutes after leaving the restaurant. But this, according to lead detectives, would have been highly unlikely as cell phone data showed that Omar Mateen and his wife never went near the club in the weeks building up to the attack itself. Also, CCTV footage picked up Omar visiting a mosque in Kissimmee roughly 45 minutes after leaving the restaurant. He did this while his wife Noor stayed in the car outside. FBI agents would go on to conclude that the family couldn't have made this round trip going to Pulse nightclub and then to the mosque. On June 9th, CCTV picks up Omar Mateen once again, this time inside the gun range at the St. Lucie Shooting Centre. Here he practices with his Sig Sauer rifle, ready for his attack. Two days later on the 11th, at around 10pm, cameras capture him walking around Disney Springs alone. It's thought that he's scoping the place out. This would be the location for him to attack, 
only moments later. But as you can see here, he passes several uniformed and armed Orange County Sheriff deputies who are providing security at the Disney property. In the end, Omar Mateen abandoned his plans to shoot up Disney Springs or any Disney properties due to the heavy police presence. So in a last minute thought, he Googles downtown Orlando nightclubs. This search produced Google results showing both Eve Orlando and the Pulse nightclub. At roughly 12.22am, he gets directions from Google Maps and heads for Eve Orlando. By 12.55am, Omar is in the vicinity of the club, but only six minutes later, he drove away and reran the search for downtown Orlando nightclubs, where he obtained directions to the Pulse nightclub. He turned and started driving southward, towards south of downtown Orlando. Between 1.12 and 1.16 a.m., he passed the Pulse nightclub for the first time, but continued to drive, and roughly 20 minutes after passing the club for the first time, decided to Google search for downtown Orlando nightclubs once again. He headed back to Eve, but was in the immediate vicinity of Pulse when he made the search, so he abandons the journey. Within two minutes of that happening, he was back at the Pulse nightclub, from this point, he does not appear to leave the vicinity of the nightclub. On the 11th of June 2016, going into the 12th, Pulse Nightclub was hosting a Latin night, a weekly Saturday night event, drawing a primarily Latino crowd. Around 320 people had been inside the venue in the early hours of the morning, and Omar Mateen is captured here on camera at around 1.41am entering the club. He then enters the main section of the club where he stays for roughly 11 minutes. He then leaves, making his way to his rental van parked in the parking lot of a neighbouring car shop. Upon entering his rental van, he then makes his way to the Pulse nightclub. After arming himself with his Sig Sauer MCX rifle and his Glock 17 pistol, he would step out of that vehicle for the very last time, make his way towards the nightclub, and upon entering, begins to fire on innocent people. When the shooting starts, people tumble over one another, trying to get out. Their lives depend as much on where they are standing as on what they do next. Twenty-five year old Amanda Alvir captures the moment shots ring out. You can see the confusion on her face as to what's just happened. Unfortunately, this would be Amanda's last moments alive, captured on Snapchat. Close by to the stage, patient Carter drops to the floor and scoots backwards. A friend, 18-year-old Akira Murray, joins her. They make a run for a nearby emergency exit and make it outside but their friend, 20-year-old Tiara Parker, is missing. 
In those moments, they could have waited for police, but they make a different choice. We gotta get Tiara, they say to one another, and they make their way back into the line of fire to rescue their friend. Very brave indeed. Back by the bar, Yvonne's Karenard, aged 29, is just steps away from a storage room the size of a walk-in closet. He shuts himself and four or five others inside. Panicked and cramped, they wait. The shooting doesn't stop as Omar Mateen is captured on the club's CCTV, going around continuing to go through the nightclub shooting people. In a gruesome moment on CCTV, one man quite literally flies through an exit door after being shot twice. At this point, Yvens opens the door to take a peek at the horror outside. I could see the shooter there, just shooting people, he recalls. Amid the chaos, Brenda Marquise McCool tells her son to get down as the shooter takes aim. Her son survives, but unfortunately, Brenda would go on to lose her life. If it wasn't for Brenda's courage in raising the alarm to her son, he would have more than likely died as well. 33-year-old Jason Gonzalez wrestles his way outside, thinking his friends Shane Tomlinson and Angel Cologne are right behind him. Angel was on the floor though, he was bleeding badly after his leg was shattered from the bullets. Unfortunately for Shane, he had been shot dead. And around this time, after making his way around the main dance areas of the club, Omar Mateen laps once again, firing bullets into bodies lying on the dance floor, making sure they're all dead. Angel, the man with the shattered leg, hears the shots getting closer. I'm next, he thinks. A bullet hits his hand and his hip, but he would later survive after Omar thought he was dead because he bravely didn't scream. A group of people are huddled in the dressing room of the club. They were hugging, saying their final goodbyes to each other, thinking these are their last moments, the last people they'll get to see. But they put on a fighting face and begin to plan an escape route, eyeing an air conditioning unit, wondering if they can pull it from the wall, but they have to remain quiet to not arouse suspicion. As police arrived on the scene though, they locate this position and begin to push the wall unit in, creating a small opening and the group of people escape thanks to the help of law enforcement. Quiet. Angel Santiago, not to be confused with Angel Cologne, is trapped in a men's bathroom stall with more than a dozen others. They do not know it, but their positions in this tiny space will determine whether they make it out alive. Angel is crouched under the sink. As you've just seen, gunshots get close to the point Angel can smell gunpowder. Shh, be quiet, be quiet, he says, as bullets tear throughout the wall, hitting his foot and knee people around him are dying. Omar would then turn his attention to the other bathroom. Angel wants to make a break for it after hearing police radios, but he's advised by others not to go anywhere or else he'll die. In those split seconds, Angel decides to go against their words and made a break for it. He drags himself under the stall, runs out of the bathroom, and goes towards police officers who by now have a heavy presence. He's in the bathroom, he tells police, and at this point officers have Omar's exact location, but it now turns into a hostage situation. Hello there. Hi there, this is Orlando Police. Who am I speaking with, please? You're speaking 
was the person who pledged his allegiance to the Islamic State. Okay. Um, can you tell me where you are right now so I can get you some help? No, because you, you have to tell America to stop bombing Syria and Iraq. They're killing a lot of innocent people. So what, what am I to do here when pe my people are getting killed over there? You get what I'm saying? I, I do. I completely get what you're saying. What I'm trying to do is prevent anybody else from getting in. They need to stop in. the U.S. airstrikes. They need to stop the U.S. airstrikes, okay? I understand they that. They need to stop the U.S. airstrikes. You have to tell the U.S. government to stop bombing. They're I, killing too many children. They're I killing too many women. I okay? understand that. But here's, here's, here's why I'm here right now. I'm with the Orlando police. Can you tell me what you know about what's going on tonight? What are, what's going on yeah. is that I feel the pain of the people getting killed in Syria and Iraq and all over the Muslim Okay. Okay. So, so, have you done something about that? Yes, I have. Tell me what you did, please. No, you already know what I did. Well, I'm trying to, to figure out how to keep you safe and how to get this resolved peacefully because I'm not a politician, I'm not a government. All I can do is help individuals and I'm going to start with helping you. By the way, there's there's some vehicles outside that have some bombs just to let you know. Your people are going to get it and I'm going to ignite it if they try to do anything stupid. Okay, I, under, I understand that and I'll pass that along. Can you tell me what vehicle? Because I don't want to see anybody get hurt. No. But I'll tell you this, it can take out a whole city block almost. I, I understand that. Tell me, in the club, do you have any injured people with you that you brought with you? I'm not, I'm not letting you know nothing. Well, I'm trying to offer I you can't. help. Well, you need to know that they need to stop bombing oh. Syria and Iraq. The U.S. is collaborating with Russia, and they're killing innocent women and children, okay? I hear what you're saying. My homeboy, Tamerlan Sarnayev, did his thing on the Boston Marathon. My homeboy, Munir Abu Salha, did his thing. Okay? So now, it's my turn. Okay? Okay. Let's start. My name's Andy. What's yours? My name is Islamic Soldier. Okay? Okay. Is, is, what can I call you? Call me Mujahideen. Call me the soldier of God. Okay. Okay. And so that's that's a lot for me to say. So can I just can I just call you something else? Do you have an, uh, a name, a nickname? Can you help me? You know? Yeah. Huh. I'm I'm here. I'm listening. I'm here. I'm listening. It's the blessed month of Ramadan, if you ever know about that. Yes, it's I do. Month. I, under, I, I understand. I fasted the whole day today. I fasted the whole day and I prayed. Okay. I, I understand that. Okay, what I'm trying to do is make sure that you and no one else suffers any further injury. Okay? I can help you. I have a vest. Okay, you have a vest. Hey. I understand that. Okay, and so what kind of vest are you talking about? Is it a, is it a bullet resistant vest? Is it a bomb vest? No. It's what they use in France. It's what they use in France. Okay. So, I gotta go. Well, well, I'd like you to stay on the phone with me, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Please stay on the phone with me so I can help pass along your concerns. You can, you, can, you, can, you can bring the bomb dog. They're not going to smell shit. Well, I understand stuff, that. You can't smell it. Okay. Bring, bring your little American well, bomb dog. Okay, well, they're fucking outdated anyway. Well, tell me, tell me, you, you're wearing, what, I presume from what you're saying, you're wearing a bomb vest? No. Well, you said you're wearing a vest. No, I'm not. So well, what are you wearing? Yeah, it's like, you know, to go out to a wedding. Okay. I'm, I'm not trying to joke with you. I'm trying to be serious and, and get this peacefully resolved. Okay? So, are you wearing a bomb vest? Okay. What can I call you? Start, let's go back to that. Let's start with that. Okay, I understand.
understand you're a soldier. I understand you're ISIS. I understand you're Mujahideen. You pledge your allegiance to someone whose name I can't pronounce. I apologize for that. As the hours went by, Omar Mateen found himself locked in the bathroom with people inside. Patience Carter, who had ran back in with her friend Akira Murray to find their other friend Tiara, had found her by this point, but they were all injured. Patience was bleeding and in pain. Tiara had a bullet in their side, whilst Akira isn't moving at all. Over these past few hours, the girls had been trapped with the shooter and they'd been hearing him on the phone ranting that he pledged his allegiance to ISIS and eventually going on to speak to an FBI negotiator to see if there was a peaceful way to get the hostages out safely. You see, law enforcement were hesitant to engage due to Omar making claims that he had a bomb strapped to him and that he had bombs in various locations around downtown Orlando and of course this was a hostage situation as well. But after hours of negotiating going nowhere, officers began to ready up to breach the wall to take Omar out. It was reported though that just before the breach, Omar Mateen let off three shots towards victims in the bathroom. According to Patience Carter, she said a man had stood in front of the group, took all three bullets, would go on to die, but ultimately would go on to save lives. At around 5.07am, 14 SWAT officers, after failing to blow open a big enough hole in the bathroom's exterior wall using a bomb due to the wall's structure, successfully breached the building when a policeman drove a Bearcat armoured vehicle through a wall in the northern bathroom. They then used two flashbangs to distract Omar Mateen and then shot at him. The breach drew Mateen out into the hallway and at around 5.14am, he engaged with officers which resulted in him getting shot eight times and dying as a result of the shootout. The shootout itself had involved at least 11 officers who fired 150 bullets and he was reported as downed at around 5.17 a.m. After the gunfight, patients and others were helped by officers. She clutched Akira's mobile phone so she could give it back to her when she would see her again. Unfortunately though, next time they'd see each other, Akira would be pronounced dead. Ultimately, the FBI opened an investigation into the situation, of course, due to his comments to negotiators and a quick search of his PC would show that he was interested in terror material, so this was declared as a terror attack. Soon after, his wife, Noor Salman, was taken in for questioning, and although she wasn't charged straight the way in relation to the investigation, she was eventually charged in 2017 with aiding and abetting the provision of material support to a foreign terrorism organisation and obstruction of justice. After a trial in March of 2018, Noor Salman was cleared of all charges after being found not guilty on both. Her defence argued that she was coerced into making false statements about her prior knowledge of the terror attack and they had even called for the dismissal of the case, saying that the prosecution had withheld crucial information for the development of their argument. It was not until after the prosecution had rested its case nearly two weeks after the trial opened that prosecutors disclosed the information in an email. Among those key details, according to the defence's filing, was that Mateen's father had worked as a confidential informant for the FBI at various points over more than a decade, leading right up to the June 2016 shooting. And how FBI also wanted to recruit Omar Mateen himself as an informant for the FBI when he came on their radar in the years prior. But again, Noor Salman was cleared of all charges brought against her, and this resulted in some of the victims' families coming out to say that they feel like justice never got served in this case. And they say moving forward, justice will never be served.